come from California, as she will tell you, no, I was born in New York. She's very proud of her New York accent and her New York birth. But the thing is, we met in California, and that's where the Lord put us together. And that's where we gave our lives to the Lord. I was raised in, uh, in Cuba. I was born in Cuba. I was uh, Roman Catholic. I was raised Roman Catholic. Went to Catholic Church. And until Castro took over and then he closed everything that had to do with God. And was when I came to this country, I came by myself at, at the age of nine. I came in where it was called Peter Pan, which it was a, a program with the government, the uh, Roman Catholic Archdiocese, where kids could leave Cuba by themselves and come to this country and be with foster families, and that was one of them. My brother was another one that came three months before me, so at the age of nine, I was living with foster families, not speaking English, so I was sort of a little lost. But thank God, he had plans. Because everything that we go through life has a purpose behind it. We don't see it at the time that we're going through it. We're sometimes going, man, why am I going through this? I'm, I go to church, I pray, I love the Lord, but why am I going through this? Be patient. He will reveal the reasons why you go through this oils that we go through, through what we go through, because we're going to be a blessing down the road for others. So be happy in what you're going through. Just ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this? We have a church in uh, Tampa, Holy Ground Christian Fellowship, and like Pastor said, a motorcycle ministry, paid in full motorcycle ministry. And uh, that like I was very happy to know today that you have some bikers here in the church. Praise God, Jesus loves bikers. Because bikers have a bad reputation. You see people on bikes, ah, they're troublemakers. But the thing is that we have a common thing with the world, it's the motorcycles. When I buy my motorcycles, I always dedicate them to the Lord. I said, Lord, this is your tool. Thank you for allowing me to gas it up and keep it clean and make the payments. But if you park someplace, like I'm sure the bikers go, no, you park the bike and somebody will look at it. And you go over there and start talking about the bike and it always ends up in the Lord. What the Lord did for you, how you're saved. And it does with us. Every time we go someplace, Somebody comes, hey, I like your bike. I go, hey, thank you, Jesus. He's the one that gave it to me. And they stand back and they look. But it's always for a reason. There's been a lot of people that have been saved through that motorcycle. And a lot of people, a lot of times, my wife and I went to California on the bikes from Tampa. And along the way, beautiful ride. The first day, she, when we got to our first destination, Pensacola, she comes up to me and goes, honey, you're killing me. I can't go like this. I can't go this far in one day. I, we gotta slow down. I was planning on making California in three days. Didn't do it, didn't make it. I made California in six days, I believe, because there were days we wake up and we would do 200 miles and that was it. Then it was too much and we pull over and get a hotel. Hey, camping in it. But we, and along the way, when we stop at certain gas, gas stations along the way, people will come up and say, thank you for your testimony. And I would look at them, I go, I'm going 80 miles an hour. What testimony did you hear? We wear a patch on our back that says, paid in full Jesus with the cross and blood at the bottom. And he would point to the patch. Amen. There's a lot of undercover Christians out there that used to come to church, but for some reason are not coming to church. They got hurt, they say by the church. No, you don't get hurt by the church, you get hurt by a man, but then you take it out in the church and you stop coming and hearing the word of God. 
we always have to find an excuse. Why am I doing this? Today, this morning when I came, I heard more word of God that if you would turn on the TV and listen to all the TV evangelists for a whole month. It was the word of God that was spoken in here. And a lot of you came to the morning service and here you are in the night service. In a lot of churches, you have two turn, two shifts, the ones that go to the morning service and then other people that come to the afternoon service. But as I look around, it's the same people that I saw this morning. And that's awesome. Pastor, you got a great group here that come and dedicate the day Sunday to the Lord, to hear the word of God, to participate, to get strengthened up with one another. And that is so awesome. That is what the church is all about. Because when we left after the gorging of food that we did and that you guys did, and I saw some of your plates. <laughs> it was just an empty building. After it was cleaned up, the lights turned off, the doors locked. This wasn't a church. This was an empty building. And then at, before 6 o'clock, it started becoming a church again. When people started trickling in and trickling in. Now, the Holy Spirit is in here. He's just going crazy. Because look at my people. They came to worship. They came to get strengthened. They came to rejoice in the name of Jesus Christ. And that is so awesome for us to be able to do. Sundays should be the day of the Lord. And we dedicate it completely. I know that when we spoke to the pastors and we told them we were going to come up, they said, oh, we, we spent the whole day in church on Sundays. And I said, praise God. That's what we're used to. To us, Sundays without church is like a day without sunshine. It's a blah day. It's no good. You sort of miss it. But it's, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so happy that the pastor let me speak. And I wanted to bring up a scripture. On John 3, right away, some people have 316. That's the most popular. But I'm going to go before and after. So please, for those of you that have your swords, John 3, 14 through 17. And before I get there, I wanted to thank the pastor for, like I said earlier, bringing the word of God. And I think that from the podium, that's exactly what should be said. I'm a type of pastor that I get what's going on in the world. And I bring it to the podium and I tell my congregation about the world and the word. They start with the same letter, world, word. But the word would overtake the world. The issues that we have today in society with abortion, with the LGBTQ, with the transgender, with all of this, we got to bring it to the church so they could get the perspective of what does the word of God say to what society is saying today. Because we are being drilled by society, by media, by everything. And from us, it goes to our kids. Our kids have no chance if we don't talk to them about the word of God, about what word me really means. Amen. We have to reinforce the word of God in our children because they're getting eaten up alive in school with their little games, with the, the false teaching that they're telling them, and with those little minds that absorb everything. But if you tell it enough times, they will start to believe it. That's why it's so important for us to pray in our homes, talk to our kids about the Word of God. And what did you learn today in school? Well, they told me I could be a girl, but I, I, I'm a boy. And we got to reinforce there's only two genders, folks. Amen. There's no three, four, six, seven, eight. Uh, now, now, nowadays, we have, you know, 15 genders. Wow. But we have to reinforce it. But it starts from here. We have to talk about it from the pulpit. We have to talk about it according to scripture. We have to talk about it what it means. It's not to take sides and stuff like this. Yes, it is to take sides. We always take this side. Amen. Amen. 
but when it comes to political things, also bring those things up. I'm a, I'm a member of the Black Rope Regiment, which is the pastors from the olden days, from the American Revolution, used to wear the black robes. But they used to come to the pulpit and tell the people what was going on in the revolution and bring the word. And after they did that, they took off the robe, grabbed the rifle, and go out and fight for their country. The people need to hear the news from the pulpit because Amen. it's unbiased, it's straight the forward, forward the word of God. What does he want us to do? And we have to be aware that we have to teach that. The people come here to listen to the pastor for the word of God, but as long as the pastor stays with the word of God, he cannot fail. Amen. And we always say the address of the Bible so you can read it, check it, and go home, recheck it. And if I'm ever wrong, I encourage my congregation, come and talk to me. If what I preached about was not in the word of God, come and bring it to my attention because I have to be corrected also. I'm human. But I always try to bring the word of God according to what word the, the Lord says. And in these verses, starting on 14, and it says, and as Moses lifted up the bronze snake, on a pole in the wilderness so the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life wow so now they're talking about the snakes in the old testament when god sent those fiery red snakes that was biting the complaining people of god the complaining israelites as we go through the Bible, we always hear them complaining. One moment they're fine, they're praising God when they're in, a, in trouble, like a lot of us do. But when things are going okay, I got, I got this. I'm all right. I don't need to pray as much. We need to pray without ceasing every single day. Pray wherever you're at. It doesn't have to be a 15-minute prayer. Just walking along, along and talking to the Lord and thanking Him for your blessings. Amen. There's plenty of prayer. Amen. And continue doing it throughout the day. I pray to him when I'm washing my hands, when I'm taking a shower, when I'm riding my motorcycle. Sometimes I get on my bike. I don't know if it happens to you guys. I leave point A and I put on my stereo and praise music. And I get to point B and I go, how did I get here? <laughs> I have no idea how I got there, but I was praising God. When my wife got in a motorcycle accident in California, when that beautiful trip, that we, she had to blow it. Uh, <laughs> we got there three days after we got to California. She was in a motorcycle accident where she ended up with uh, brain hemorrhaging. I was behind her, watching her. She was on the bike in front of me with one of the girls from the program in California. And they both had their hands up blasting praise music and they were singing that's the last spot sight that i saw my wife before the accident with her hands up singing to the lord and she went up this berm came down i thought that the lord had taken her the first words out of my mouth were please lord don't take my wife don't take my wife and when i looked over where she was i thought he had taken her she was just out. I went across the street and I laid on the floor and I'm going, honey, honey. And guess what were her first words? No, but I close. But <laughs> my wife is, uh, is uh, a clean fanatic. She's laying on dirt and she goes, they're ants in here. <laughs> after she was almost crushed by a trike but i praise god you know they called me from the hospital after she got there and asked me permission to drill her head to make the hole <laughs> first and foremost i asked the doctor uh doc what happens if i say no you gotta find out the pros and cons folks and he said she'll die i go well start drilling doc 
And uh, next time I saw her, she looked like the Bride of Frankenstein. She was shaved up here and a tube right in the middle of her head with blood coming out. Those doctors, and I know I'm getting away from the subject, but I'll get there. Uh, those doctors with so many degrees that you could write them all on a roll of toilet paper and it still needed paper because they, the big three neurosurgeons of the hospital, they were all together and they come to me and they go, Mr. Mato, if your wife comes out of the hospital, she'll be a quadriplegic. You will have to take care of your wife for the rest of her life. And I just looked at him, I remember looking at him straight in the eye, I go, I don't believe you. We serve a mighty healer. Amen. You're practicing medicine, he heals. Amen. I don't believe you. And they looked at each other and they walked away. Second day they come, they said, Mr. Martin, if your wife comes out, she won't be able to use her limbs. That's pretty close to being quadriplegic. So I still told them, I don't believe you because we serve a mighty healer. He Amen. will take care of his daughter. Yeah. Amen. They did this to me for three days. Strange that three days. After the, after the third day, they didn't want nothing to do with me because I was knocking them down. I was saying that I don't believe what their titles and their older education. And believe me, and their doors it says practicing medicine. We have a savior that doesn't practice. That's he right. does Amen. it, he heals, he creates, he does everything. <clears throat> so why am I gonna take their word? They told me, oh, she'll be here for a certain amount of time. I go, I don't believe you. So after calling him a liar for so many times, uh, my wife came out of the hospital a week before they expected. She walked out of the hospital Amen. and the tube out of her head was taken out three days before schedule. So I know that the Lord was with her. I know that the Lord was proving a point. Honey, he used you as an example. Amen. And it, it's just amazing to see what he can do. Yeah. I've been in three motorcycle accidents where I should be dead. I'm here. He used me in all three to be a testimony. He doesn't want me yet. He wants me to continue doing his job, doing his work, doing what he has called me to do. I am uneducated. Well, I got some public education in me, and that, that's like uneducated. Uh, but I preach the Word of God. I know the Word of God. I'm not afraid to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ out, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Anytime, any place, anywhere. We used to go into uh, where's that place in LA that uh, where all the homeless, where all the homeless used to be in LA. They used to have them confined in an area. I forget the name of it. The mine is going. I'm getting old. Please pray for me. Uh, but we used to go with the bikes in there. Where when you turn the corner, the smell of ammonia. And you know they weren't cleaning with ammonia. It, the smell of ammonia would come out, and if you had a cold, you would have good nasal passages because they would just clear you up. But the word of God was preached there. There was one night at two o'clock in the morning, my wife was in there looking for a particular young lady that her mother called her, that she was looking for her daughter, and her daughter was a drug addict. So if when you're with the Lord, don't be afraid of where he sends you because he will protect you. It doesn't matter what gets in the way. Didn't David face a giant? Didn't David kill the giant? And nobody thought that he was going to be able to do it. I truly do believe that David didn't even know. He didn't have the faith until he swung that rock and it hit him between the eyes. Sometimes we are that David. And the issues that come against our life are the lives. But like what it says in here, God sent the snakes and then he tells Moses, get it, make a bronze snake. Skid row. Skid row. Now you tell me. <laughs> Skid row is the name of the place in LA. Now homelessness is everywhere. 
it's I was raised in LA and now I'm I'm ashamed to go to LA the way it is. I thank God that we live in an area and we come to visit this area and it isn't like LA LA. If you see pictures on and you go, oh no, that's that's an exaggeration. No. You're going down the freeway and you see tents in the middle of the freeway in a little grass area and trash all over, drug paraphernalia all over. Pray for this country. I always pray for this country because even though and I'm not ashamed to say it, this administration is taking it down the toilet. Amen. It is still the best country in the whole world. Amen. Okay? And we have to defend it. We have to stand up for it and believe that God is not going to bless you. It's not going to allow it to go down the dump. But we, as Christians, as believers, we have to stand up. We have to stop being that silent majority. We have to be able to stand up and say, that's not morally right. That is against my morals, and I'm a citizen of this country, and we will not stand up for it. We have to put our voice in. We have to unite, not divide ourselves with the Methodist, the Baptist, the Lutheran, the Catholic, non-denominational. We serve one God. Amen. Amen. We as humans divide ourselves into those different denominations, <clears throat> and that is wrong. We served, we went to a, a Catholic church, Anglican church, and the bishop told us, we serve the same God. We're working for the kingdom, and that's exactly what we're all doing. And we have to unite and bond together against the common enemy that's coming our way to separate us, divide us, and eventually they want to take this book away. I don't know if you guys have heard, but now artificial intelligence, they have said that can write a Bible for everyone. Yep. A world order Bible. We have to stand up against that. That's why the Bible always tells us, hide the word in your heart, because at one time, this is going to be outlawed. In California, they refer to this book as a hate book. Why? Because it talks against LGBTQ. It doesn't say to kill them, stone them, or anything. It says that their way of living is against God. It's a sin. It's an abomination. So is drunkenness, fornicators, and everything else. But they just focus on the LGBTQ because that's what they want to make the big deal about. We have to stand together. And that's where the churches are today. We're dividing, and it's up to the pastor behind this pulpit to bring the church together. How many times have you seen on TV the, these uh, motivators? I'm not even going to call them pastors. Motivators of stadiums full of people, and they're all clapping. When do they bring a scripture of the Word of God up? No. They said, oh, be good. You know, God loves you. And this and that. Oh, Jesus loves you. And Jesus died on the cross. But what is it that we have to do in order to be that Christian that the Word of God? We have to be believers. Believers in His Word. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Not just readers of the Word. It says believers and doers of the Word. Amen. Yeah. You see a lot of people with Bibles that are all yellowed out with a lot of marks in the Bible. But it's not how many marks you have in the Bible. It's how those marks have affected your life. Amen. Are you walking those marks that you have in the Bible? Oh, this is a great scripture. But are you walking? Are you living it? Are you showing it to your neighbor? Are you showing it to your family? A lot of people do super Christians in church. But that there's a force shield. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Right out the stores. That as soon as we go out. And excuse the word, we'll become wimps for the Lord. We're valors, we're warriors inside the church. We sing, we raise our hand, we holler, we say hallelujah, we say amen. But as soon as we walk out, well, I don't want them to know that I'm a Christian. I don't want to insult them. 
I don't care if I insult anybody outside if it's for the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. We have to stand on the word of God. We have to show the world that we're believers. Now getting back to this snake that I'm trying to get to. Okay? God sent those snakes when the population, the people of Israel were complaining all over again. And he sent those snakes and those fiery red snakes was biting them and killing. And they started complaining to God. Oh, why is God sending them this? And they went to Moses. And Moses, like always, went to the Lord. Lord, why? Why are you sending this? And God told him, get, make a bronze snake, put it on a stick. And when they look up to that bronze snake, they will be healed. They will be saved. Now, have you noticed what the symbol for medicine is? They use two snakes on a stick. I was researching that, and they say that uh, the reason why that is because snakes shed their skin, and when you take medication, you become a new bull pucky. <laughs> There is no such thing as medication. That just keeps you on the same illness that you're going through. It doesn't heal you. It just treats you and makes the pharma companies richer and richer. Amen. There is no healing in medicine. Okay? And my brother was a doctor, and I used to tease him. I go, oh, so you're practicing medicine now, huh? Good. But they don't heal. They're not interested in healing. Because if they gave you a pill or they gave you medication to heal you, you will need to go back to them again for another copay and another insurance uh, bill. It's quite honestly, they just want us to keep going back and depend on them. And here God said, if you look at this snake, you will be saved. But it also says that the Son of Man must be lifted up. Wow. John is talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. When the Son of Man was lifted up on that cross with his hands and feet pierced and that crown of thorns, we just have to believe in him. Amen. And that's what John 3.16 talks about. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But we say believe. But again, now our English language has been watered down. When in those days, when you say believe, is that you are willing to die for what you believe in. Nowadays, believe is, oh, I believe that's there. I believe that's over there. I believe in you. I believe in you too. It's watered down. It's not the strong word as it used to be, like the word love. Those Christians, those believers in those days are willing to go into an arena and face wild animals and be devoured for their belief. Are we? I'll be straight out. Are we? Are we willing to face our enemy face to face because we believe in Jesus Christ? A lot of us aren't. I pray every day, Lord, if it comes down to it, where the enemy comes down and puts a knife on my throat and says, denounce Christ or I'll cut your throat. Mm -hmm. I ask, Lord, give me the strength to say, no, I will not denounce Christ. Amen. Because we all say, oh, I'll deny it. I'll, I'll, I'll stand strong until the death. Like Peter, this morning, you talked about him. Oh, no, I'm willing to die for you. But when that blade touches the skin, this goes, well, let, let's, let's have another talk. You know, you could say you don't want anything to do with Christ and repent later. But no, once you denounce Christ, you denounce Christ. The unpardonable sin, straight out. I pray for strength that I stand strong before the enemy and reclaim what was Jesus Christ from the very beginning. I pray to be bold for the Lord. If I don't make it out of here when he comes back in the first bus and I stay behind, because I'm realistic. 
a lot of us here in church say, oh no, I'm leaving. But you know what? We will see each other again after the rapture. Because not everybody that comes in through those doors is going to go on the first trip. I'm just being honest. You might hate me. and You know, I live all the way in Tampa. So you, I know you're not going to be knocking on my door tonight. I'm just being honest. I'm just brutally honest. Not every, and I talk this way to my congregation, not everybody that comes through the door and sits in the pews and says, hallelujah, it's going. Amen. Amen. What's in your heart? That's Amen. what Jesus, it's not what comes out of our lips, it's what's Amen. in our heart. What is our life like? Do I walk like a Christian walk? Or do I say I am, but I walk crooked? Do I walk a firm walk with Christ? Or do I hang out with my friends and curse and get drunk and act like the world when I say I'm a Christian? That's why the world looks at us and says, you hypocrites. In the outlaw world, the bikers know when they go to outlaw, what they say they do. We are the ones that we say one thing and do another because we want to fit in. That's why I'm saying that the church has to stand strong and it hasn't been standing strong. That's why we're in the position that we're in today. The church has been too laxy-daisy. Oh, we don't want to offend people. You're not offending them if you bring in the word of God. Amen. You're saving them. Yeah. You're strengthening them. Amen. And you can always back it up with the word of God. That's why I get so riled up at times with some pastors. Well, no, you know, I, there's one on TV. And I'm not an Osteen. <laughs> I've never told my congregation that they're sinners because I don't want to insult them. Oh, so you're sending them to hell, though. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. You're making, you're looking pretty to them. You look nice. But how are they going to look at you when they're all burning in hell and telling them, why didn't you tell me? Amen. Why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you help me? I don't want to be that guy. Because this says that the blood of the, the, the one that speaks, your blood is on his shoulders. All your blood is on his shoulders. Wow, oh, you better have some big shoulders, Pastor. And that's what it is. You got to bring the word of God out. And each and every one of you should be praying for that man every day. Amen. Because we don't know the attacks that pastors go through. We might go through attacks, physical, spiritual, mental. You don't know how many phone calls he might be getting. He might be getting phone calls at 3 in the morning and getting up and going to somebody's house to pray for him or go to the hospital. You don't know how Satan attacks him to discourage him from coming here on Sundays and bringing the word, staying at home and studying the word. Distractions that happen. We get attacked pretty hard. But you know what? It's only by the grace of God that we continue going forth. Because we want to fulfill the calling that we've been called. I heard a pastor say one time, he says, I've never been to seminary school, theology school. Because when you go to theolo theological school, you come out a student. God calls pastors. Amen. And only... God is the one that calls pastors. The other ones are want to be pastors or, oh, hey, I want to be a pastor. I want to be in front of people and talk. That's all you're doing. You're talking. You're not doing anything. I didn't go to theological <laughs> seminary school. I was doing Bible studies. I was preaching and outreaches and all of that. But God had people watching over me. They came to me and asked me, the Lord has touched our heart for you to be ordained. The day I was ordained, there were 12 different pastors from 12 different churches that came. And I'm not saying this to lift myself up. I'm saying this, that God watches over you. If he calls you, you're going to be what God calls you, not what you want to be. And pastor, how long do I have? 
I'm long winded, so go ahead. Tell me. When I get done, hey, that sounds like a good time. Okay, not done yet. All right. So here we go with verse. We heard verse 16. For God so loved the world that he loved, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But the main thing, look at verse 17. Verse 17 explains why Jesus came down and died on that cross. And we, I want to say we, W-E, put him on that cross. Because he died for all of our sins. What is the verse? God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through who? Through him. I'm so happy he didn't come and judge the world, he, that I wasn't judged, and I'm glad that he didn't come 30 years ago, because I would have been in terrible trouble. I'm glad that he hasn't come yet, because you know what? Our job is to bring the word to other people. Go yeah. make disciples of all nations. Amen. Bring the word of God out. Don't ever be afraid and say, I hear this a lot, but pastor, I, I don't know the word. Pastor, I, I don't, I don't know the word to preach to somebody. You don't have to preach. Just say your testimony. Amen. What has God done in your life? Right. Speak about it. What? Ha, how has God changed your heart, the way you look at things? How has God manifested in your life? That's all you have to say to people. You don't have to preach and do a sermon and have it ready to hit people over the head with it. Don't be a Bible thumper. By the way, I, I just like Bible thumpers. Tell me about the Lord, but don't beat me over the head with this because His grace is going to make me duck. Say the word, say what God has done, and let me see your walk. My wife and I got saved in a biker church in California. She calls me up one day and goes, Honey, I just gave my life to the Lord in a biker church. I go, you what? I didn't know about being born again. I was a heathen. Uh, I'm a product of the world. I was out there, and she wasn't too far behind. And when she told me that she gave her life to the Lord, I first her, and I kid you not, first words out of my mouth was, Honey, don't drink anything they give you. <laughs> Just Jim Jones, Kool-Aid. Don't drink anything they give you. She goes, oh, honey, it's a biker church. You know, the pastor has long hair, a big mustache. He has tattoos. He comes to church and a tank top and all sorts of Harleys parked up in front and bikes. And I feel at home here. I go, oh, honey, please. And then she goes, well, they're going to have something next week, an outreach next week. I want us to go. Uh, dun, 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 dun. I just told her, honey, I'm not going to promise you anything. So come next Saturday, I was being a good husband, I went. And I used to have a, what we call crotch rocket, oh. one of the Japanese race bikes, the plastic bikes, that at this age I couldn't ride. But it sure feels good to go that fast, though. And uh, she was behind me. And as I made the turn into the park, the only thing I see is Harley, 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 Harley. And so, for some reason, the Harley guys just don't like crotch rockets. And I said to my wife, it's not going to be a good day. So we park, we go over there, and I see all these guys that they're biceps look like my thigh. <laughs> Big old boys with tattoos, the teardrop, and they got their hands up crying to the Lord. I mean crying, just tears coming out and praising God. <laughs> I've never seen that before. I go, oh, that's pretty neat. I didn't know what was going on. I was a neophyte to all of this. So the pastor is, here comes the pastor with the mustache, the long hair and a ponytail. And he starts preaching the word. Then at the end, he makes an altar call. Anybody who wants to give to the Lord, come up to the front. I said, oops, this is not for me. I didn't come here for this. 
So, and I don't know where my wife was. I went to the back end of the park. And I'm looking at this, and I didn't have anything in my mind. I didn't, wasn't against it, I wasn't for it, I wasn't anything. I was just in la 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 land from what I have seen. To me, it was something new that I've never seen. People, men, men really crying out to the Lord. I've gone to churches where I see women, and nothing against you women, you know, women crying. But I've never seen these burly gangster type biker guys, you know, that came out of prison crying like little kids out to the Lord. And it was, I was at awe. And I'm standing at the very end of the park when I, all of a sudden, I feel like a rope come behind me with arms and hug me and said, come to me, you're ready. My first reaction, somebody sneak up behind me? No. But I actually felt the arms and a robe come behind me. And I said, okay. Made a beeline to the front, gave my life to the Lord, and that started my beginning of being a Christian. Amen. But the thing is, is that we have to obey. We don't. We cannot second guess the Lord. If we know it's Him, because I knew we had, I, I wasn't a Christian, but I knew the Holy Spirit was there. I knew who the Holy Spirit was. I knew who Jesus was. I knew who God the Father was. Everybody, every pagan knows that. But when I felt them, I felt a love and something else in my heart that I went up to the front. And I was glad that I did that. That was over 32 years ago. And I've never slipped back. I've never backslidden. I've always been going forward. I'm not one of these hallelujah jumping up and down. Jesus loves you. Jesus saves and all of this. But I've been going forward all my life. And then when he called me to be a pastor, I came in like a cat that you have him over a bucket. That you're trying to put him in and all the legs are straight out. Oh, no, you're not putting me in there. I didn't want to. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I wasn't looking forward to being a pastor. Again, I don't know scripture. What am I going to do? I'm not equipped. A lot of us believe that we're not equipped. Then you believe that you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. If God is in you, you are equipped. He will give you the words. Today, I thought that I was coming up here just to introduce myself and say a few words because the pastor sort of got me the other day and says, uh, do you mind saying a couple of words on Sunday? I go, sure. My wife and me, honey, are you ready for today? I go, yeah, I'm just going to say a few words and that's it. I come in this afternoon and the pastor gives me the mic. I go, oops, those few words are going to turn into a speech. But you always have to be ready from here. Amen, and where do you get it from here? From the fortification of gathering together. Do not forsake the gathering of the saints like a lot of people do. Oh, I'd rather watch it on YouTube. I'd rather watch it online and stay home in your pajamas and having your breakfast instead of getting up and do, being a living sacrifice, getting dressed and coming here and gathering with your brothers and sisters and fellowshipping. I'll tell you, today, this morning, it was a great time fellowshipping with each and every one of you. I was looking, looking around, and probably some of you were saying, who's that guy looking at me? But it didn't matter. I was feeling my brothers. You guys didn't know you had a Cuban brother, did you? <laughs> Guess what? I'm here. And a Puerto Rican sister. She's there. Amen. It's awesome to have the same father, different mother. Yeah. Amen. And we all share in that. So that my main thing to you is continue being strong. Continue encouraging each other. Continue lifting that man and that woman up in prayer. Continue coming here and filling each and every one of these benches with other people. I heard a lot of people were sick. You know, call them up. It's not only her responsibility or his responsibility. If he's your brother, call him up. If she's your sister, call her up. Say, hey, praying for you, missed you, love you, God bless you. You don't have to do a 15-minute speech. Call them up. Show that you care if you really do care.
because we're all called by our Father to do His will, not ours. Even He, in His flesh, when He came here before He got arrested and taken up to Golgotha, what did He do? He left everybody behind to the side and spend time. How many times in the Bible did Jesus go by himself to pray to the yeah. Father? What does that tell us? That prayer is so important. Amen. That prayer is so yeah. powerful. Amen. The word is powerful. It's more powerful than a nuclear bomb. Because it goes from here to heaven. A nuclear explosion just goes a certain radius. Our prayers are heard in heaven. And what did he say? If you could take this cup of suffering away from me, oh, please do. But let it be your will, not mine. Sometimes we don't want to do his will. <laughs> be honest. But it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the one that was whipped, spat upon, beat up, put a crown of thorns, slashed, whipped, stabbed, and crucified that our sins were put on his shoulders. That's why he said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Because my sins went on his shoulder. And the Father cannot be where sin is at. So please, if you do anything, fortify each other, get stronger. Marry couples, pray with each other. My wife and I pray every day together. Before we go to bed, I don't care if she's mad at me. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the situation is. We always come together and we pray. We never go to bed. We don't leave the house without kissing each other, telling each other we love each other. God bless you. I'll see you. Show your love to one another as Christ has shown it to us. Pastor, if you have anything else you want to share, I think I'm clocked out for the evening. I want to um, thank you guys. Uh, the wife wants to say who, what? I just want to say that... Um, it is a blessing being here today. I'm sorry, I got emotional. Today has been really awesome to meet every one of you. The way you guys come together, you don't see that in churches anymore. It's not the same. And I'm going to say this. I know they haven't said it. I don't know if they have or not, but the pastor's daughter and the first lady's daughter is seeing a son. And I'm praying for marriage down the road. So I believe this is a praying church. And if you guys could come together with us and help us pray that, that would be a blessing because I'm asking God not to take us home until I see us, our children serving God. That's my desire and that's my request for you guys. If anything, that you keep them in your prayers. His name is Artem Eli, and of course you guys know Melissa. Beautiful couple. It's like God brought them together, even though they're not doing things according to the word of God. But I know that they will. I have that faith in my heart that they will. That's the only thing I have to ask all of you, and that if it's God's will for us to move out here, we will it out here. Keep that in prayer, too, that God will just direct us where he wants us to be. We're going to turn country. <laughs> <laughs> you like them apples. <laughs> I, I told my wife in the beginning when we first moved from California down here, honey, I want a place out in the country. I don't want neighbors where they could hear me when I sneeze. Yes, I want some distance between my neighbors. And But I do ask for a garage for the motorcycles. Those are, those are the girls. And swimming pool. Well, <laughs> she gave me two out of the three. She yeah. gave me the swimming pool and a garage. But she moved me into suburbia. I don't like 
when everybody in the neighborhood knows what's going on in your house. I like distance between my neighbors, and if somebody is walking to my house, I have more than five feet to be able to know that they're coming to knock on my door. I'm just that type of person, especially the way things are getting now. And we, and she's a city girl from New York, always likes being close to the supermarket, to Macy's, uh, and to, you know, civilization. I'm not saying you guys live in the Tulis, but <laughs> when she came here uh, today and we went out yesterday, we went out in the golf cart. That's a first. We're cruising the town in the golf cart. And my wife got a pool. We've been there for 11 years. She's been in the pool four times because her fear is, I don't know how to swim. Well, stay in the shallow end. You will, you know, you can stand up and be the water up to here. But yesterday, for the very first time, she was in the little skip, is that what you call it? Little skip up the river. She, she you went up the river, baby. <laughs> and I was so impressed. I was very going, this has got to be a God thing. And then she started looking around and as we're driving, she goes, you know what, honey, I wouldn't mind. I'm ready now to move out here. <laughs> and the happiness, my my heart started skipping a few beats. It sounded like a drummer. It was just going nuts. Because I love love it out here. I love the, the, the openness. I love the country atmosphere where you could knock at your neighbor. You don't even have to knock at your neighbor. Your neighbor's looking out for you if you have good neighbors. <laughs> Because I'm not going to make this look like heaven. There is bad people everywhere. But what we felt, what we saw in the pastor's neighborhood from what he has told me, I like that. And I, and I asked the Lord to allow us to spend the last few years that he has us here living in that kind of atmosphere. And then we will definitely see you guys again because we'll be coming here. But uh, it, it's been a pleasure. I thank the pastor for allowing me to speak. And again, I love each and every one of you. But I will never be able to love you as much as Jesus does. Amen. God bless. Pastor. Well, praise the Lord. I appreciated that. Amen. 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 I, I, I immensely love hearing our associate pastor and, and all that. And you probably get taught of hearing me sometime. But sometimes I appreciate it when we have somebody. It, it just throws some spice. Yeah. You know, the man of God come in and share with us in the heart. And we hear other ministry that's taking place and what the Lord's done and what the Lord's currently doing. And it's just exciting serving the Lord. Yeah. And I can, I, they told my wife and I when we started out in foreign missions, they said, what well, and, and serving the Lord, they said, well, now, it must be an awful dull and boring to have to go to church all the time. So I say, are you crazy? We have been shot at. We've sailed across the oceans. We've been in foreign countries. I said, you, the only way you're going to get past that is maybe join the Navy SEALs or something. <laughs> or maybe a motorcycle club. I mean, <laughs> that was an experience one time, too. We actually performed a wedding ceremony one time for a group of Hells Angels and Outlaws. That was quite an experience, I have to confess. I actually concluded, I didn't know if they were actually born on planet Earth or not. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, they have souls and Jesus loves them. Amen. And uh, so we all have a lot we could share, but I've enjoyed the day. Amen. We Amen. appreciate the word, Pastor. We appreciate it, the company and the word. Appreciate it. Anybody have anything to add? See, we come to a close. Be praying.